Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming today. Tonight we're here to kind of talk about a kind of combined super use case. I'm trying to show one possible end to end and use that as a excuse to talk about um, the compositing of different pieces and tools that are available to us and the improvement of the tooling landscape around doing machine learning. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank um, Eli and Puneeth in particular uh, for their help in putting this together. Um, the code that we're going to kind of step through today uh, definitely had some challenges and bumps along the way, and we'll be kind of talking through some of those uh, points as well. And of course, the Cloud Developer Relations team, um, thanks to them for their continued support of you know, this and, and other efforts to engage with the community and gather your feedback. Quick check, can you hear me okay on the mic? Awesome, we got a, we got a little. <laughs> so, so yeah, it feels like it's like only sort of picking me up sometimes. Um, so I'll try to shout where possible as well. Okay, so we wanted to show a couple of things and then we got a couple more things and then the title got really long and then we cut it down some and that's what we ended up with, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a bit of a mouthful. There's a lot of things in there. We really wanted to capture what we were trying to show and not leave anything out. We ended up leaving a few things out, but not everything. So that's what we got. Uh, we're gonna, but the title is pretty descriptive. You know, we're going to go on Kaggle. So who's heard of Kaggle? Kaggle.com. Right? It's a data science uh, platform, community website. You can run code on there. You, there's the competitions. There's forums, and we're gonna use Keras on Kaggle, right? And we're going to use the GPUs that Kaggle has. Yes, Kaggle also has free GPUs to use, so that's fun. And train up a model in Keras, but then convert that model and export it to be suitable for running on Cloud ML Engine so that you can scale your predictions and serve them broadly. And so that's a whole kind of process. And so hooking that entire workflow up and then actually calling that endpoint, that REST endpoint, uh, with new previously unseen data. That end-to-end -end workflow is kind of what we're aiming to achieve today. So uh, we, in the description, kind of said that this could be viewed as a pseudo workshop. I'll step through all the code on screen as well. But if you want to you know, log into or create a Kaggle account, all you need is an email. Um, you can do that. It's free, of course. And if you already have or um, you know, have a cloud account set up, you, know, you can kind of get that ready. Uh, at some point, there will be a link with, um, to, the, to the code that we'll be kind of playing with today. So of course, this is a, what did we call it? Not the cloud AI huddle, the Google AI huddle. <laughs> and the, um, you know, going into this, for the most part, I'm going to make some broad kind of general assumptions around uh, base knowledge around machine learning. And so I'm just going to throw this slide up here as kind of a level set of saying, you know, my short and sweet definition of machine learning is basically just programming with data, more or less, right? Like, if you strip away as many details as you can and try to make something that's shorter than the title of this talk, this is kind of what you end up with. And our plan in more concrete detail around what we kind of looked at earlier is we'll grab the data. And we'll talk about what data set we're going to use. Then we're going to do some fiddling with the data. Then we'll do some more fiddling with the data. And then we'll create our model. We'll do training evaluation. Oftentimes, after doing that, you kind of go back and have to revisit the other steps. And then there's some more, right? There's, oh, yes, and we should turn on our GPUs at that point. And we'll convert that model um, from Keras to a TensorFlow estimator, which can then be exported to a save model which can then be uploaded to Google Cloud Storage. Then we can create a model version on machine learning engine, and then we can make a prediction. So it's, it's definitely a long kind of workflow, right? And so this is intentional in that I wanted to highlight the fact that while there are a lot of tools out there, there are ways to get them to fit together. Some ways are easier than others. Some ways are harder than others. But uh, increasingly, the compatibility surface between different tools, different products, 
are growing every day. And so I think while we pass through this phase where you know, not everything is going to be super, super duper easy, you kind of have to embrace uh, multi, you know, different tools, different environments, and trying to get them to fit together, even if you have to kind of shave the corner off of one piece to get it to kind of fit together with the other. So the data set. Who has heard of the MNIST data set? Yes. So I figured we would do something a little more interesting than MNIST, but only a little bit more interesting. It's called eMNIST. It's the extended MNIST data set. It comes from, to us from the same you know, National, National Institute of Standards and Technology, but we get some letters, right? Better than just 10 digits, we have some letters. And not only lowercase, but also uppercase letters. Yeah. But more notably is the fact that we are, you know, it's predicting across 47 classes. And of course, the format is also very similar. It's still MNIST. It's still 28 by 28 grayscale images. <coughs> so on one hand, it's still that same sort of stuff. But on the other hand, you know, it's something less boring than 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And moreover, the kind of differences between the capital letters and lowercase letters can make for some interesting uh, interactions, right? And you'll notice that there's only 11 letters that are different enough between their upper and lowercase representations for it to like really count. Like the letter X is not gonna show up and you know, make us figure out, is this a lowercase X or an uppercase X? Apparently everyone's handwriting is too bad for <laughs> there to be any distinguishment. So that's our data set. Um, let's talk briefly about libraries, right? We're going to use Keras today. And Keras now is integrated as part of TensorFlow. And so TensorFlow has all of these layers of its library. It has the low-level stuff where it can run on all sorts of platforms. And then there's the Python front end, which is still kind of TensorFlow core and still relatively low-level. And then you have the layers, which is similar to the Keras layers, if you've used that, which allows you to construct your model layer by layer. And it's still kind of low level. It's your hybrid step, call it. And then above that, you have this abstraction layer where you can basically, um, it manages a lot of the training cycle, it takes care of, gives you some pre-canned models, things like that. And that's kind of where we'll be operating at, but on the Keras side of things. So we'll build a custom model and um, use Keras to do it. But then we'll convert that Keras model, that trained Keras model, to a TensorFlow estimator. And the current only like, good reason to do that uh, in our particular case is, especially since we're training it in Kaggle, is that we need to export it to a TensorFlow estimator. But why do we need to do that? Is because we need to put it on Cloud ML Engine, which at for now at least, only accepts TensorFlow saved model formats. So it, it kind of forces our hand there. Now the typical reason you would export um, a Keras model, or at least convert a Keras model to an estimator is for the ability to do better distributed training. So typically you would, if you were to use them together, you would construct a Keras model, but then instead of training it using Keras, you would convert it to TensorFlow Estimator and train it, as, train it as a TensorFlow Estimator because then you get distribution and uh, GPU kind of scaling for free in terms of there's no additional work. So that's kind of the typical kind of thinking there. Uh, in this particular case, we're going to still continue training it on the Keras path and have a trained Keras model that we then take it through all the rigors of uh, exporting. Question? Yeah, just the data. Yes. Um, because if you're using MNIST or EMNIST or whatever, that comes loaded with the Keras. But if you have your own data, and especially if it's a big data set, which you can't just load into memory, but you need to have that whole Keras data directory structure, then you flow. Where do you keep the data in this whole thing? Yeah, so the question is about you know what happens when you have data that's bigger than memory that's not, quote unquote, included with the library, right? So in this case, uh, EMNIST, I'm not using the one that's included with the library. So we'll actually see that. We'll see. Um, we'll use a generator, we'll flow the data from directories. And so, yeah, we'll, we'll get right to that. Awesome. Were there any other questions before I continue? Cool. Uh, and then I think I had one more slide here just as a side note that there's also canned estimators that are kind of also, just, they take care of even more things for you and you don't have to like really 
manage a lot of the underlying stuff. So that's of less interest in this particular uh, use case. OK, so Keras, uh, as of 1.8, 1.7, uh, showed up inside TensorFlow as tf.keras. And you can pull it in. You know, If you have TensorFlow installed, Keras is already there. And using the Keras that's inside of TensorFlow gives you access to everything that Keras has with the addition of those um, Keras model to estimator conversion tools. And um, some of the underlying implementation is different, but the interface or the API abstraction layers are identical. Just another really quick. Yeah, go ahead. Because um, the big reason I wasn't using TFKs, I didn't know, I don't know, is uh, the image data generator and uh, also this flow from, I didn't think that they were there for the TFKs, but they were there for regular pairs. Right, so the the Keras that's in TensorFlow is, you know, kind of line for line, or at least like the the API. All the calls you can make for Keras are there. It's strictly a superset. So the stuff in TensorFlow is just Keras and a little something extra, basically. Um, so you can, you know, the ideal is you can take your Keras code, your existing Keras code, change that import to, uh, you know, import TensorFlow. And from TensorFlow import Keras and be done. You know, so so it's it's that degree of guarantee in terms of identical API. All right, so the um, notebook is uh, on Kaggle, and if you don't want to type the long URL, you can type the shorter URL. That's still kind of long, and this this whole pattern: long titles, long URLs. So apologies for that in advance. And then I guess we'll. You know, the, the, my goal is to spend the majority of the time today kind of actually going through the code and talking about that and answering your questions and kind of being able to engage in the discussion there. All right. Oh, yes, a question before we go on. Question. Uh, so, like you mentioned, it's an iterative process, right? So, every, anytime I want to tweak some parameters of the Keras to dresser or whatever I'm creating, I have to go through the Keras to TensorFlow estimator, TensorFlow to save model each time I iterate? Uh, you're, you're saying if you, that's only if you want to deploy that model, right? So, and we'll see by and large these steps uh, have been mostly automated. So, once you get it, the pipeline set up, it's just you're just running code. So, it's not like actual work at that point, but there's some setup. Okay. So, if you uh, went to that URL, this should be what you see. I have um, failed on my bit.ly links before, so it wouldn't be the first time that <laughs> it went to the wrong place. but. <clears throat> If I can find my mouse. OK. So one of the neat things about Keras, uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar with it, is that it's, go, yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Um, we'll, we'll play with this size for now. And if we need to shrink it temporarily later, if things get too long, uh, flying off the page, we can do that. So one of the neat things about uh, Kaggle that I personally like is that when you put up a notebook, right, it kind of, they got around the problem of Jupyter notebooks being kind of unreproducible in that you can run Jupyter notebook cells in whatever order you want. And then when you give it to someone else, you know, if you weren't careful about making sure you ran everything from top to bottom in order with no repeats and, you know, did a little test where you cleared everything and started over and you're like, okay, it all works then you could really you know, hand someone a notebook that doesn't really work or they can't reproduce. And so with the way Kaggle you know, forces your workflow, you're editing the notebook and then you hit commit and run. And it commits the notebook, like Git style, and saves your versioning. But then it runs that notebook in a separate virtual machine. Clean environment, top to bottom, one cell at a time in order. And so it ensures that you know, when someone else takes your code and tries to do something with it, it actually does the thing it's expecting. <coughs> so uh, at the top here, it's just the imports uh, from TensorFlow, import Keras, as promised, and um, some plotting, NumPy, pandas, the usual goodness. Uh, the other piece that is useful here, uh, as the woman in the front mentioned with the EMNIST data set is, you know, I'm writing, running this notebook from the Keras data set itself, right? So assuming that the Wi-Fi holds up and I haven't randomly broken the Kaggle website, 
this website will eventually load. And <laughs> the data set, that will do, uh, oh no, I don't have it there. Oh yeah, we'll do that. So the data set you know, lives as a bunch of different files and there's information about it, but basically it's in this directory relative to the position of the notebook. So I go and I set this path and I can read in our training and test data. Uh, there's the data set itself is actually organized by a bunch of different um, kind of groupings. There's kind of this note balance data set, which is meant to be the most applicable in general. And these are kind of the stats around how many examples there are. And you have your 47 classes, but there's also a bunch of other ones that are um, split differently and some of them are significantly larger or smaller. And um, you can, you know, this is from the paper from when they released the data set. The one we're using is this first one, which is balanced across letters and numbers. And so it's kind of nice to work with, 3,000 of each. And the other ones are kind of all over the place, but it's more something that more closely resembles essentially the raw data that they had and they didn't normalize as much. Okay, so yeah, we'll, we'll go through this early part pretty straightforward, right? You load the data, you read it in, take a peek, it's what you expect. Um, Kaggle has a tendency to load everything in CSVs. Obviously, you do not have to store all your data as CSVs, um, but lots of zeros. And the first column is that uh, label. So here, uh, it really illustrates the importance of like, well, what's 45 mean? This took me a while to figure out, right? And we saw it in the slides, but basically there's this mapping where there's, you got to get these letters and numbers in the right order so that when you look it up later, it actually works. So like, if you get a number up here that's 34, you know, I can just index into that string and, and now I know it's a Y. So that, that's kind of how I got around that problem. And we can see here our training data is 112,000 uh, rows, just as we expected from, uh, where is it, balanced data set. Okay, so ooh, text got bigger. Look at that, free size boost. Now, one of the things about this data <laughs> is that the, for whatever reason, the way they stored this data, right, it's flat, right? It's a CSV, each row is one letter or number. We need to recombine them into a 28 by 28 image. And the standard way of kind of that, um, when you do a standard reshape, it actually ends up with something that is transposed and doesn't, isn't a number. So that's supposed to be a K, just as FY, in case it wasn't clear, not pi, K. And um, it's because they're transposed. So you want it to look like that. And so this illustrates, you know, this is a good opportunity for us to illustrate a little bit of uh, pre-processing. You know, I'm just basically um, pulling out the data, reshaping it, and then calling numpy.transpose and flipping the two axes, the zeroth and first axes to be first and zeroth. And that, that gives us our flipped result. So we'll have to you know, do that every time we want to show the image. So I've made a little function to help us do that. So now you don't have to write that yourself. Um, the other piece of it is understanding, like what we said earlier, that the class number, the class label, right? Class 10 is actually a capital A. And so when I'm naming these, you, know, you, you do the various lookups that you need to do in order to <laughs> obtain both the index of the label as well as the letter it or number it corresponds to. So that all kind of comes together as one function. You know, we do our transpose, and this is kind of my pre-processing function basically. Whenever I want to load the data set from a file name to something that we can use, um, this is kind of what I'm doing. Uh, read in the file, and then here I'm just setting some um, values in terms of the dimensions of the image. I could just skip that and just use hard-coded values. But And then we have our transpose. Here, the transpose is a little more involved because when you actually grab the full data set and not just one image, it's 112,000 rows by 768 or 769, right? One extra um, in the front. So we have to um, just flip the middle two, right? because the first one is the batch size, so that's 112,800. And the last one is the dimensionality, in this case, one. And so we switch them. So instead of being 0, 1, 2, 3, it's 0, 2, 1, 3. And then the final thing is um, 
just kind of a bookkeeping or yeah a step to switch our labels to one hot encoded uh, just for the Keras model to be able to read that in properly. So that changes it from being you know one, two, three, four, all the way to 46 or zero through 46 to being an array of 46 values, one of which is a one and the others are zero, the index of which corresponds to the value. Um, <clears throat> oh yes. And because these are images, uh, the number of times I have forgotten to divide by 255 for grayscale images, and then subsequently gotten terrible results, and then went on Google and Stack Overflow, and it's like, well, you know, predictions are crazy. It's a, there's no result on the internet that actually tells you, like, if you're training and your you know, predictions are wildly nuts and you can't figure it out, you probably forgot to divide by 255. So there you have it. Now it's on the internet. Um, let's see. Yes, now we got to make our model. So looking back at our roadmap, oh, our roadmap is a far way back. Uh, we got the data. We did some adjustments, some more adjustments. And now we got to create our model architecture. So in Keras, uh, model creation is re relatively straightforward. Some of you would agree. Some of you would disagree. Um, but we can set it up here. I'm building a convolutional network. Uh, just to take advantage of the fact that we'll have a GPU in play, so may as well have it do something useful uh, rather than just you know training a crappy network. And given that we have 47 classes, it's possible that if I just did a fully connected deep network, it might not actually perform that well, right? So, um, and then we have our you know the first convolutional layer. I just chose some numbers. Um, I tried to keep it small to make sure. You know, especially as I'm iterating, it, it made it allowed it to train a little faster. Um, I'm doing, what am I doing? 12, 18, 24 depth filters, uh, five by five, three by three, and two by two um, kernels going through, and just standard ReLU um, activations with some dropouts in the middle. Um, yeah, I'll pause here for questions about model architecture, or is this pretty run of the mill for folks here? So, okay, so the question is, am I using TensorFlow? I'm using Keras inside TensorFlow. Yeah. So I'm using Keras in terms of my syntax. I'm using the Keras uh, API to construct the model. And, um, you know, in, in as far as, for all practical considerations, I am using Keras. You know, after I create this model, you'll see here, I can call model.summary, and it prints out exactly as it would if you were using Keras, right? And, you know, after you train a model like this, if you were to do um, model.export, and you'd get a .h5 file, or sorry, .save, right? It's the exact same uh, behavior to a T. Um, so yeah, then you do the, but yeah. So you have a dropout of 0.5. Yeah. How did you come up with 0.5 instead of 0.2 or 2.5? Is that logic behind? Is that, sorry? Is that a logic behind? Is there a logic behind why I chose 0.5 as the dropout? Um, I decided to go with an aggressive dropout to see uh, what happened. I think what happened was I originally had much larger uh, convolutional layers, and so I was trying to punish it a little more. But then I shrunk it and forgot to lower the dropout. So um, this isn't meant to be a kind of state-of-the-art model. It's not um, kind of I'm not mimicking any particular paper or anything like that. This is literally I just kind of back of the envelope kind of spitballed some numbers out. Um, the idea here is to demonstrate the workflow, right, of piecing together the tooling, uh, not so much demonstrate a, you know, state-of-the-art convolutional network. Yeah. But the good news is, you know, if you have a Keras model that is really good, you can literally just drop it in the cell and everything else should just work, which is kind of nice. Um, at some point I was debugging and it was having trouble getting the shapes and stuff, so I made a little thing to print out all the shapes as lists. But you know, these numbers correspond exactly to the numbers you see in the summary, so there's not a super high yield use case here. But there you have it. You can get all the shapes at every layer. All right, let's train it up. So training, um, as we alluded to earlier, we're going to use a generator. And in particular, I have a couple of options here for you, especially if you take this notebook and go and do stuff with it. Uh, we're just, I just ran the vanilla version, but I actually wrote the code for the other pieces as well. 
Um, there's the standard image data generator, and there's also a version with uh, augmentation. So if you pass in a bunch of arguments, I'm going to make this smaller by a little bit just so we can see the arguments more easily and doesn't like new line itself to death. Um, you know, the standard one, I'm just saying, uh, just train it, give a 20%, 80% validation split of the training data. Whereas with this one, you can have it alter the image, right? Because they are images and because we reshaped it at the top, rather than passing them in as arrays of 768, we um, are actually passing in 28 by 28 images. So we can pass in all this stuff around uh, shifting the image around, as well as rotation, zoom, and uh, shearing of the image, the tweak. And so that sort of stuff can help you know, introduce more variety into your data set if your data set isn't super large. In this case, I have 112,000 examples. I figured that's probably OK for now. And so <laughs> I, I opted to just use the normal data generator, but yeah, thought this might be handy, so I left it, or left it in here. And so we pull out our two generators, so we call the generator.flow and get our training and validation generators and pass that in to do model.fit underscore generator. And um, you know, for a while, I was doing 10 epochs. 10 epochs does work pretty well here in terms of it gets much further along. The sixth or 10th epoch do matter. Um, I just made it five for, for a while. I probably forgot to change it back because it just runs faster, right? And so when I was testing, I didn't want to um, have it run forever. So you know, with five epochs, we got to 71%. With five more, we're closing in on 80. And for this being kind of a back of the envelope random network, um, it's not the worst. It's of course, like, as you mentioned, certainly not <laughs> not the best network in the world. Um, and it's certainly not you know trained to any you know crazy degree either. So uh, so yeah, at this point we have a trained model, right? And then we can call evaluate and pass in our test data generator that we made um, here. The evaluation, I'm always uh, imp impressed at how concise uh, that can be, right? It's like very similar to the training code in that we load in the data the same way, just pass in the test data path instead of the train data path. And then the data generator is, is very straightforward to call, and there's not much in the way of arguments. Since when you do evaluation, you only need to pass through the data set one time instead of kind of looping it over and over and over. Uh, the numbers that are coming out here, the first number is the loss, and the second number is the accuracy. So on our test data set, we're getting about 77%, which you know, is kind of like a, eh, not the worst. For, for being kind of random, you know, there's, there's some numbers together. It's like, I'll take it. Um, let's see. Yeah, and then just a brief look at some predictions. Um, here's one such example. This is the letter D, in case it wasn't clear. This, <laughs> you know, it's like an upside down P. And when we load it in, um, oh, sorry, this one. I think I might have just been visualizing. And then, oh yeah, I decided to, instead of trying to pick numbers myself, I just picked 10 random ones. Um, these are the 10 that happen, happen to run. So the predictions are on the first row, and the labels are in the second, the correct label. right? So you can see we got some wrong. Um, we got most of them right. We got that one wrong. We got that one. That's the same one I got wrong. Look at that. So whatever 41 is, this G, um, it keeps thinking that whatever 44 is, is actually a G. So if 41 is G, H, I, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J. So J's and G's, you can see how that might look similar. And for a lowly trained CNN model, it might struggle in that department. Here's an N for those who were wondering what the N's look like. It kind of looks like upside down N for some reason. But um, some more letters. Hmm. Anyways. So that's prediction. So that, so far, everything we've seen is kind of your standard Keras stuff, right? There's nothing um, that we've really looked at that's super wacky or you know aside from import or from TensorFlow import Keras. Everything else, you know, you, this so far could have just been a how to train a convolutional network using Keras. Um, so let's see if we move on from the kind of creating model training and such. We get to the kind of some of the interesting pieces here. So Keras.estimator. So this is one of the pieces that were added to Keras in the version that's inside of TensorFlow. So normal Keras does not have a .estimator module. And so you have this estimator.model to estimator. Basically, it's a conversion function. It's a utility function that will take your Keras model 
And now, right now, I have the model as a Python pointer, right? I just I have that in a variable. You could also, uh, if you had a Keras model that had been previously exported, there's a different argument. I think it's like Keras directory or something. You can pass in, or the file name, you can pass in the exported file directly. You wouldn't have to load it first and then put it in. It'll take care of that for you. And so you could also you know, get a model that someone else is giving you or saying like, hey, you know, I got this thing. If you want to try it out, and you're like, oh, I want to you know, do X, Y, Z, but use TensorFlow estimators, go for it. And so then once, it's, um, once you have the model, right, the estimator does need a place to live. So this model directory is the directory for the estimator model, not the directory for the uh, Keras model. So that's why I tried to you know, give it a good name, like estimator model, so it wouldn't get confused. And uh, the only other side note I would give here is that when you use this, if you, if you were to use this to convert to an estimator and then actually do more training on it, which we could, but we're not going to in this case, the um, input functions that you use need to ha have kind of a, a name for what to call the I forget what the proper term, but basically there's a key to the dictionary of inputs. And that key is COM2D input in this case. So you grab it from the um, model.input names uh, that's coming from the Keras model. Because you couldn't explicitly set it because it was built from Keras, Keras sets it for you. So next, we're going to take that TensorFlow estimator, right, estimator model, and now we need to export it as a file. So to do that, it's a little bit more involved um, because what we're going to do is we're going to set it up so that we can read in uh, JPEGs and PNG images directly rather than reading in a row of a CSV file because that's not an image. Right? We built a CNN. These are supposed to be handwritten letters and numbers. So you know, when you're actually, if you were to imagine writing a production service which accepted, you know, that had to do this task. Wouldn't you be sending images, right, enc um, encoded over the wire, and not an array of numbers encoded as, you know, an array with commas between? Like it would just be terribly size inefficient. So you would encode it using, you know, Base64 on a JPEG or Base64 on a PNG and send that over the wire. And so to take that and then remunge it back to a bunch of, you know, a long array of numbers, it just manually, no less. Uh, just doesn't feel right. And so uh, what I recommend here doing is you know, TensorFlow has a number of utilities to help us create kind of this serving input function. So the inputs to the model when it's serving predictions can be different, can have kind of a different head than what is used when we're doing training. So in our case, we did training in Keras anyway, so that's kind of like done and we're set. And what I'm doing here, I'll kind of try to walk through this as clearly as possible because it is kind of easy to get lost, is we use some raw TensorFlow pieces here to get this done. So the first piece is a TensorFlow placeholder. A placeholder is basically what it sounds like. It holds the place for where data will come in. So this is where the binary image, the six, uh, base64 encoded byte string will land. So it's a string. And it is zero dimensions. And so we're calling this input pH. pH is short for placeholder here. And what we're going to do with that is we're going to call tf.decode images. And what that does is it will take a image and decode it into, uh, in this case, unsigned int 8 uh, array of, a NumPy array, a tensor of unsigned int 8. And so there's a couple of things happening here, um, but at the core of it, this, this is what we is notable, right? We're saying, from here, decode this. And what we're calling to make that happen is map. So we're going to use map to map decode onto whatever the input is falling into the input placeholder. Decode image, however, takes as a default argument, uh, channels is three. It's expecting a color image. But our images are grayscale. There's only one channel. And so because this argument here, the first argument of map is a function, 
not a function call. I'm using the ten, uh, Python func tools, right, to do a wrap around it. And it's same, essentially a lambda where um, I just set the channels to one. So now when, I, when it calls this, channels will be set to one by default. And so it's a little bit convoluted. I probably could have broken that out into a separate line, what I just highlighted, and just called that like you know, custom decode image, right? And so we say map function, our decode image, onto input placeholder, and the output type is unsigned int 8. And then we're going to cast that because the defaults are this. And um, we do want it to be use a TensorFlow cast to float 32. And then, of course, I almost forgot to do this, divide. 255. All right. So that's kind of our image. So we've transformed our input, right, which was just the placeholder because you know we don't know what's coming in yet, into a um, grayscale image that was divided by 255. The final thing we need to do is that to know that decode image actually is smart and knows um, the dimensions of an image coming in. And so the image that it spits out or the, the 2D array that it spits out will be those dimensions. And because of that, we do not know at compile time, so to speak, what the dimensions of an image will be, because that happens at runtime. This runs into a problem later on where when the model tries to export, it says, oh, I don't know what dimensions you're going to use. And so that's why we need this final line where we set the shape. This isn't explicitly changing the image. It's more of, you think of it as like an annotation. It's kind of a, let me give you some more information, some more details. It's like metadata. And tag it as none, which is the batch size, right? You can pass in three images. You can pass in 70 images, one image, whatever. And then it's going to be 28 by 28 by one, because we have one channel. It's grayscale. And then what we're going to do, right, we have input, placeholder, and we have images. Those are our two things. And we're going to use that. Here we have images and input placeholder. We're going to use these two as arguments to the serving input receiver. And this is a wrapper utility function that will generate uh, what we need to tack on to the top of our model to use as an input function for serving um, predictions. And so I'm choosing to use the model name, the model input name, that com2d underscore input. And um, the second argument. I would recommend using bytes, um, and we'll see why, but just believe me <laughs> for now that we'll use bytes as the argument. But you, you could theoretically change it. But if you do change it, um, it should end in underscore bytes. So bytes is fine. Um, and then what we pass in here is images and the placeholder. So basically, it's saying this is the first argument is what will be going into the model, and the, the second argument is what is coming in the top uh, before that, right? the placeholder. And then all this code maps the two together above it. So that's the serving input function. This is probably like the most in-depth I've ever tried to explain it. There's, there's so many things going on. It's hard to get right. So hopefully, um, if you have a use case similar to this, you can take this code and just largely use it as is. And so the step you get after that is a lot more straightforward because we did all the work. You call export save model on our estimator. And we pass in, wow, making it bigger made it bigger. Uh, we pass in a directory. I just say, just make a folder called export to stick it in. And pass in that function that we spent all that time kind of working through. And I just print out the export path to take a glance at it. So this is a, you know auto-generated timestamp. And that's why I like to put in a subdirectory. Otherwise, you're just going to get a bunch of these at the top level, and it's just a mess. I also included the Keras exports just for fun. <laughs> and so we saved the, you know, the Keras model using the separated ways, the JSON and H5 weights and model structure, as well as the full model um, weights and structure together. And so now when I do um, LS, what we see here is we have our export folder that had all that stuff. We have our full model from Keras. We have our model.5h5 and model.json. And we have our estimator model, which is also a folder which contains the checkpoints that you could, if you wanted to, take and train further in TensorFlow. So that's kind of the training, evaluation, conversion, export workflow. Um, I also included a. The yeah. The estimator model is just weights, right? The estimator model folder is. Yeah. Yeah, the checkpoints only contain weights, right? Yeah. 
And the, I just have a simple plot for accuracy, which is pretty useless here because we did only four epochs. And, but you can see how if I kept training, it would actually improve. Like we're not really done training yet, but it's more of a placeholder for if you take this and do more interesting stuff with it than I have, you have a little chart that you can use. Um, loss is the same way. And we're going to pause here and we'll um, come back to this notebook and do the rest of it once we have a use for it uh, shortly. So let me show you the output. So as promised, there's a bunch of outputs. Um, some of these outputs we haven't seen yet because I create them later, but basically in the um, export folder, there is, yes, save model.pb and our two variables, um, you know, those are the weights. And so this will come out as, let's see here, don't mind the random, there we go. All right, downloads. No way to make this bigger though. <laughs> or is there? Nope, no way to make this bigger. Um, so this is, you know, when you click on the model and you hit download all, you get a zip and you unzip it and you get this. And then you have things like your save model.bp and variables. And so you can just take this entire folder and upload it to a bucket on Google Cloud. So in my case, I've created a folder here called emnist underscore keras to tf, keras to TensorFlow. And then inside that folder, I've been, wow, this is a terrible Zoom experience. And inside that folder, I've created you know, a couple of versions because this has gone through several cycles. Um, the v3 ones seem to work. You have our thing and our, our .pb and our variables. And so when we want to create a new model uh, with Cloud ML Engine, what that looks like is you go to ML Engine and you go to Models. And you can click Create Model. And when you say Create Model, really it's just a wrapper. It's literally a name and a description and nothing else. So say I call it something like this. And, you know, hey, I created a model, right? So it's here. And there's nothing in here, right? There's no versions. So we need to create a version to um, actually do something with it. So when we create a version, we click Create Version. And we can give it a name. This name is permanent within that version. Now, of course, you can delete the version and make a new one and stuff. But it does need to be unique within a given model. So let's call this, you know, maybe first version or v1 or v.1. Um, and there's a runtime selection here. Uh, Cloud ML Engine maps to a couple of different runtimes. These quote unquote runtimes have behind them different versions of TensorFlow, different versions of you know, you know, various other Python libraries that you might care to use in your Python code. I typically just select the most recent one because you know, I've been using the most recent version of TensorFlow. But there are those who are using, for example, TensorFlow 1.0 still. Right? They're using that in production. And so this supports kind of compatibility back to that. And there's a whole list of the different versions of what libraries are in each one. Uh, I would recommend selecting it manually because it will default you to 1.0 and then you will be sad. So if we copy this out, we take this directory. Right? So what it wants is a directory. Oops, I didn't want a definition of it. A directory of where these files live. And so you'll notice here that because TensorFlow exports the models not as a single file, but as a folder of various things, um, you want to always make sure there's a wrapping folder for it. Otherwise, it can get, well, messy, right? So it needs to be a folder with nothing but these two files. And you'll also notice that as I highlight this, right, this is basically what you need to paste in. Um, this is the bucket name, and then these are the folders and the path to it. Uh, you can hit Browse and you know, navigate your way there. But if you already have this open, you just, you just finished uploading the files and stuff. You know, may as well just copy it over. However, when I do that, I am greatly saddened because it says folder not available. And the reason for that, and I, I say reason, but I say that in a very weak sense of the word reason, is that it is looking for a folder. And 
the UI argues that a folder must always end in a trailing slash. So I will now press slash. Ta-da! So this is my note to the UI team that is building <laughs> this. And to, if they had a slash here, we could just copy paste that over, right? Then we wouldn't need to worry about it. So that's my latest gripe. So remember the trailing slash, and you will not be um, disappointed. Or you can use the browse thing and just select it, and it'll populate it for you. But it'll create its version. It'll do its thing. Uh, all of the operations that we're doing on the UI right now are uh, accessible via API and command line. So you can use command line to do this, script out on Bash. Or you can call it through the Python API, the Ruby API, the Go API, Java API, whatever you want, and um, automate it using that. So there's a lot of options there. You can use the APIs to create versions, create models, delete them, edit them, change the name. Well, you can't change the name. The name is permanent. But you can delete it and create a new one. And um, you can do all those things. So you can you know, automate the whole process. You can add testing in and, and various kind of pipeline. Uh, it's almost like CI, CD, but for machine learning uh, to, that, to that effect. So it's going to create its thing. And it's going to take a while because sometimes it takes a while. But luckily, we created one earlier. And I created one. Um, let's see, let's go to our models. And I called it EMNIST Kaggle underscore Keras. And I failed the first time, but the third time's the charm. And so I called it v1, v2, v3. The name of the um, call is E and this Kaggle Keras. And my window is behaving. OK. Find the thing. Promise I'll make this bigger. Oh, this is going to be really good when I unplug later. Everything's going to be huge. So to make this call, we need to um, basically I did a bunch of experiments recently. <laughs> OK, so we call gcloud ml engine predict. We say, what model was it? Right, Just that same string name. We say what version it was, in our case, v3. And then we have to pass in this input data file. And so this brings us back to where we were earlier. I promise we'd go back to the notebook, and we will, or we are. So let's go down, past all the stuff we saw earlier, and look at after the graphs, as soon as my computer decides to scroll, we're going to create some output files for, I mean, some prediction files for ourselves. Um, I had this originally in a separate Python script on my local machine, and then I realized, wait, we can just do this in a notebook, and then you all have access to the code, which is great. Um, I used the same call to that whole transpose business that we did at the beginning to take a whatever row of data and um, do the thing where you know transpose the values. Then we can use the PIL library pill to pull out um, an image, render the image from an array. So we originally this array is actually um, in 64. And so it will complain at you, so you need to cast it as uh, unsigned in 8. But then you have your image. And then I used the same code that we saw before that I used to label those images with both the class name, the label you know, 47, 32, whatever, and figure out the letter that it corresponds to to make a nice file name for myself. So it will be class something label J or something like that. And we're going to export one of them. And so that will give us a PNG, right? And so now with that PNG file, we need to base64 encode it. Right? So the steps, they keep coming. And so we have our class 19 label J PNG. And we're going to encode that into JSON and call that file class 19 label J dot JSON. And so to do that, we'll uh, read in our PNG file and base64 encode it. Note that base64 encodes in Python 3 behaves differently than Python 2. <laughs> and those of you who have experienced that are smiling and nodding right now, um, rest assured that the first time I encountered this, I was not smiling nor nodding. It is uh, horrendous. Because it comes out as bytes. And you know what's not bytes? Strings. Strings. <laughs> Which is what you want. And you know what else you can't encode into JSON? Bytes. And so <laughs> you, know, you try to call this, and it doesn't work. And then you realize all you have to do is wrap 
str around it, and it works. Or change your environment to Python 2. So those are your choices. <laughs> Um, and then so once you have that, you know, and you print it a bunch and you're sure that you're doing it right and you're like, ah, you can write it to a file. And that's, you know, the most straightforward thing ever. You just dump it out to a file. And this is our base64 encoded letter J. Um, I know it doesn't look super compact, but it's much better than 764 grayscale numbers with commas in between them and spaces. <coughs> and so that's kind of the final bit of the story in Kaggle is that we're going to use, we use the um, output abilities of this to kind of output us our class 19 label j.json, which we can then use uh, when we want to call our model. Incidentally, I wonder if our model finished, because then we can actually call it and prove to you all that it worked. <laughs> so it finished uh, loading it up. So let's see. Decided to refresh itself. So we want to say Google AI Huddle is the name of our. Where is? I have so many windows. Okay. So we want to say model name <coughs> equals Google AI Huddle. Version name. Does anyone remember the version? Oh, we have many mixed things. So yeah, the old one was V3, but we're changing to this new model, right? I, I don't actually remember it, and no one's speaking loudly enough. First version. Yes. First underscore version. And um, the data file I already actually have set, but I'll show you. Um, it's class 19 label JSON. And I, I do have both the JSON and the other file here. But there you are. There's the JSON. We can look at it, I guess. That, that's probably more useful than just seeing it. There's, as we expected. Now, what I've done here is I've wrapped it in. Um, two pieces here. One is bytes. Remember we said bytes earlier? We want to use bytes in our serving function. So this is the word bytes that maps to that word. So it's kind of a random word. You can put whatever you want. So you know, you can, it doesn't really matter, but mo almost all the samples will use bytes. And B64, so you need another layer inside, which is you know, another thing that sometimes will trip people up. At any rate, we've set our values. So um, let's. All oh, right, I never actually ran this line, so let's just run it. So this is the command line utility that you, know, you can use to interact with Google Cloud. And it will come back with a mess of numbers. So <laughs> this is the other funny thing about this, right? It's like, what is all this? These are the probabilities of each of the 47 classes. And so what we really want, right? It's like, tell me what I really want, um, is to run argmax. Um, and so we get 19. And if you'll recall, our file was 19j. Um, we can also open, um, what is it called? Yeah. And I think it's png. Oh, good. We can't open it, apparently. But we can. Pull it up in other ways. Downloads. Oh, right, I had it somewhere. It's a tiny J. Right? It's our tiny J, and then we have 19. Yeah. So that's kind of a crazy journey. J for journey. J for journey, yes. Thank you. <laughs> That, that it takes to kind of get from, you know, you taking the data, and we did all that stuff to get it set up, right? And we train our model, which you, know, you can train however you want. And then on the flip side, right, we did all that, and that was like the first bit. And then we spent the rest of the time hooking everything else up together. But once we have this hooked together, notice that all the pieces are entirely scriptable. And all the, almost all the code was in the Kaggle kernel, right? And so you can imagine, right, I haven't like actually deployed this, but you can imagine a situation where you can have kind of a real, real time-ish situation where you have code commits going in on one side to you know, a, your training models, you have something coming out, and then you can drop your folder that gets picked up, and, and then all these steps happen. And then at the end of it, you have a deployed model that's ready to serve. 
Um, one of the things I like about the Cloud ML Engine's kind of prediction side of things is that as easy as it is to create that uh, version, you know, while it does feel like we didn't really earn having a uh, you know, globally uh, productionized model that scales automatically based on demand, is secured, has a REST API for free, along with all the client libraries across all of the you know, six major languages that Google Cloud supports. It feels like we didn't really earn that, right? We just gave it a name, pointed it to a directory, and just said, like, all right, do all the things. Right? And those things are like you know, replicating it across servers across the world. And it's, it's available now, right? It's available to be called at scale and you know, from any device that connects to the internet. So it means you can call it from your phones, an app. You can call it from IoT devices. It means that if you need to get predictions from you know, edge, pieces, edge devices that are connected to the network, you can do that. Um, and obviously, f for, from web and servers and things. So um, wow, we're really far back in the presentation. OK, go back. OK, so yeah, we talked about the tooling. Um, yeah, we've kind of fit to this together, right? There were definitely some rough edges here and there. It's not a you know, one click, oh, we're done, look at that, because <laughs> that would make for a much less interesting talk. But piecing these pieces together is both, you know, fr can be frustrating, but the end result, we're getting to a point where the end result is oftentimes more valuable and worth it, worth the, the pain, so to speak. And you know, everything gets smoother and smoother over time, and so these, this tooling will get better and better. But in the meantime, you can reap the benefits, especially because even though it's hard to put together initially, it can be set up as a you know, reproducibly deployed pipeline that you can use to keep pushing out predictions, keep pushing out new models, new versions, doing A-B testing, things like that. And you know, as more tools come online, as you, you know, are familiar with all these pieces, you can imagine branching off Right? It's like you, you, know, you train along, you do this thing, you deploy here. Maybe you know, you're training a, a TensorFlow model, and now we're going to convert to Keras. Right? You can do the reverse. You can, you know, instead of doing it on Kaggle, maybe you're running uh, a notebook locally, and then you can export and do the same sort of thing. So a lot of this knowledge uh, carries across multiple kind of disciplines in a, in a way. Um, yes, questions? Um, the, mo the model you just mentioned about from the Keras to TensorFlow, is that OK for like um, the model generated by the PyTorch for a different kind of the framework? So the technique that we're looking at here is a kind of utility that's inside of Keras, the one that's inside of TensorFlow. So it's specifically um, a piece added to Keras to enable the conversion of Keras models to TensorFlow estimators. As far as existing tools, I'm not actually familiar enough with existing tools around conversion of PyTorch models to TensorFlow models. I think I saw something to that effect. Um, I'm not sure about like officially supported tools, though. You know, like this is an officially supported converter from Keras models to TensorFlow models, and that, that's also part of the appeal of it. Like everything I've shown you here today, none of it is kind of some experimental side project that may or may not exist next week. It's all things that are kind of essentially deployable in production. Sure. So the question is around, you know, if I deployed a V1 of a model, and now I want to fine tune that model, uh, what tools are available in Google Cloud to achieve that? So when you deploy a model, that's kind of your serving model, right? We, you saw the code where we called export, and we supplied a serving function. Uh, when you call export save model, you know, some of the things it's doing conceptually, you can imagine, is that the weights in the um, model are being frozen. And so whereas when you're training, you want to obviously allow the weights to be updated. And when you deploy the model, you just want this model to run as fast as possible to spit out predictions, right? So when you want to do fine tuning, you should go back to the model you were training, right? Pick up where you left off and do your fine tuning there. And so you can almost think of it, it's similar to kind of uh, developing code when you have kind of your main trunk of code and then you have releases, right? And if you want to tune your code, so to speak, you wouldn't take that release back and unpackage it 
and start working from that source, right? You wouldn't decompile your code or anything. You already have your source code. You just continue working on, along, and later on, you know, next week you have another release. So similarly here, you're training your model, you export it, you deploy it, you can keep training it, you can keep tweaking it, and you can deploy <laughs> another one, right? And when you do, you could do kind of uh, split A-B testing where, you know, you, you put some traffic to one, some traffic to the other. Because when you actually call these endpoints, as we saw, you specify not just the model name, but also the version. And so you could put some kind of load balancing or A-B split testing if you wanted on top of that and say, call version this, or then a little bit on that, just to make sure that I didn't just break everything by deploying a new model. So uh, where targets do you uh, support for the estimator? So obviously you just support the Google Cloud and the target. But uh, Google also has um, uh, edge devices with uh, machine learning accelerated built in. Yes. Uh, do you support those as targets as well? So the question is around whether we support um, exporting saved models to um, be deployed on devices aside from cloud machine learning engine, in particular uh, edge devices. So the format of the saved model, the export saved model, it's, a, it's the TensorFlow model export format of choice. And from that, you can kind of go in a number of directions. It's, it's the most versatile, so to speak, of the choices in terms of um, formats, and you can kind of downconvert, so to speak, to other things. So the version we're using for a Cloud ML engine, right, is just directly, no, no further conversion needed. But you can use things like um, XLA, or Accelerated Linear Algebra Libraries, which is a part of TensorFlow, and take that and um, use that to alter your exported model in ways that make it more suitable for running on edge devices that cause it to shrink the model and things like that. Okay, but the, yeah. the models may, the devices may be proprietary. So for instance, mm. Intel has an accelerator. Sure. Sure. If Google is uh, integrated into one of their product sets, they have a compiler that uses a facility called Freeze Graph. Mm -hmm. But um, I'm a person who had any issues with uh, version skew. Huh. Every time I run into a new issue, then I have to rebuild my entire tool set. Wow, OK. Uh, and so I'm trying to get away from that activity. But uh, there's no way that I could come up with a compiler that would take a safe model and target this device, because it's proprietary. Right. So is there any effort or intention uh, to support these devices? So the devices are devices that are coming from, from, in this example, this partnership between Intel and Google? Uh, well, it's a partnership between Google and Intel. Uh, they, they have uh, some neuromorphic chip sets and, and uh, various. So they're faster than GPUs, and they're targeted specifically for machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, and uh, uh, they seem to be one-offs now. So, for instance, you have a camera and it does facial recognition and so forth on the image, but uh -huh. it doesn't export it to the cloud to do the recognition. Sure. It does it on the so, you're saying you want to load your own models onto those pieces of hardware? Yes. Interesting. All right, and are those devices open for like developers? Like, there's an SDK to. So, there, there is a, in this particular case, um, I can take Curis and I can develop a model from, say, ImageNet or, or what have you. Sure. Uh, but it's 32 bit floating point. So, yes. Uh, and then there's a compiler that's supplied uh -huh. that compiles down to the target. Okay, yeah, that, that's but typically the XLA. This is outside this export. What, uh. what, what I, because what I see, what I believe we're, we're headed towards is we, we have the front end where we do the development and create the, the our internal architecture mm -hmm. of our software, which is hardware. But then we may want to export to the cloud. We may want to export to multiple devices to support acceleration through uh, device-specific uh, trans translators. Yeah. And if there's a, a single reference point for doing that export, then it makes the whole process easier. Great. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, the, I guess that would be my comment. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah no, we'll, uh, I think these are great comments. We'll continue that. Just a real quick announcement. We're going to do uh, a, a paper survey. Oh, so, paper uh, survey. We'll do that, do that right now uh, while you're here. Uh, 
And uh, yes, uh, please carry on. Uh, continue asking your questions. Cool. Yeah. So to to kind of talk about the oh, there's some more. There. Cool. Yeah. So make sure you remember. Yeah. There's a raffle at the end, so remember your numbers. We can. <laughs> it's a separate thing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, your, your comment around kind of architecture-specific deployments. You know, I think where we're at today, we basically have a situation where when you export a model to this export save model, that's like the full. It, it captures the full richness of your model, its weights, its structure, everything. Right, that's the highest fidelity version. And then typically what happens is you then start uh, tearing it down for other architectures. You start adjusting and start you know, fiddling with it. And so I, I would imagine that you know, at least for the majority of, kind of um, architectures, we're, we're kind of getting to a point where, especially with the XLA compiler, it is extensible to make it suitable for other kinds of architectures. Um, so obviously you don't want to be in the compiler writing business, but the idea is that others, right, the, the makers of those um, chips, the makers of those uh, chipsets can then use that um, you know, specification and kind of extend XLA to enable these kinds of conversions. Yeah. So, so kind of like a you know, point and hub and spoke model? Yeah. yeah. Other questions? Yes? Five million what? New predictions per day, per second? Like five million per what unit of time? Like, are you saying just the raw amount or the rate? The rate. So five million in how much time? A second? <laughs> Yeah, so what's the current scale of making predictions uh, with kind of ML engine? A lot of it is going to depend on your model, right? Like the, the size of the model, the size of those images you're sending in, if they're images. Um, the other piece of it is kind of, it will probably take a second to ramp up, especially you know if you're dumping it with a lot, right? So those first couple might be a little slower, but then as it scales out horizontally and spins up more servers to respond to the increased request load, uh, you, you, it'll certainly, you know, become more and more performant. Uh, Robbie, do you have any comments on kind of what, what kind of benchmark testing you've done in terms of just back of the envelope performance? So the most important thing is how long each prediction takes. Like if it takes a millisecond, obviously we can do a lot more QPS because that requires fewer resources. And if it takes 10 seconds, then we can do a lot fewer. But the general rule of thumb, I would say, is I think you can do about 1,000 QPS with a really simple quota request. If you want to do about 10,000 or above, we most likely can do it. But you'll need to contact us, and we'll need to work to make sure we have enough resources. Uh, but we can easily scale above that and beyond. So just contact us if you're interested. Awesome. Another question? Oh, yeah. Follow up. If you had much more expensive ETL for training or for prediction? Oh. So yeah, I guess that would depend on the domain, right? Like especially if you're if you're willing to go out to um, you know, a separate system to do ETL, it sounds like you're doing batch prediction then, not kind of online uh, responsive prediction, but then you know, you, you can do a fair amount of ETL on TensorFlow, but yeah, if you if you want to do kind of mass transformations, yeah, you should use whatever tools you're comfortable with. Um, if you want to stay within Google Cloud, there's you can run Spark on Dataproc, uh, and if you're kind of developing a new set of ETL, you can also use things like uh, Beam on Dataflow. So there's a Beam is an Apache open source kind of ETL transformation tool that you can allows you to use the same source code to transform both stream and batch data. Um, that's where the name comes from. Beam is batch and stream. And they um, and you can run it on Dataflow, which is kind of 
intended to be kind of a next generation ETL service where you can just basically, it's sort of like the, the way ML Engine works where you can just submit your code and it'll just run. You don't have to think about machines and the size of the machines and how many machines. It's just, here's my beam code, here's my data, go make it happen. And it parallelizes everything for you. And so that, that part of it's nice. Um, the final piece of it would be uh, tf.transform, which is a library for doing, you guessed it, transformations. Um, it's based on the Beam API. So there's a lot of similarities there, which allow you to kind of carry things over. Um, but by and large, you have, you know, th those would be kind of some of the options in, in that space. Right. Yeah, another. Do you have an orchestration language? Oh, right. So once you've deployed your model like you saw there, you have access to the batch prediction API, which will allow you to do, it's, it's throughput optimized. And so, you know, we don't really talk about QPS. It's more about, it's, it auto scales to as many workers as you want. And so you could use that in an ETL pipeline if you're using some orchestration system, like Argo or Cloud Composer, which is uh, Airflow or that type of thing is another option. Yeah. So a lot, lot, lot of options out there for kind of, you know, moving data around. I can stop calling off the exciting part, this is, this is why you all came, right? <laughs> you saw the long title and then you were like, wait, but I can get a backpack. <laughs> uh, other questions while, while we wait for numbers to appear? Well, I also recently learned that if you um, type into Google search, um, random number between X and Y, like well, random number between 50 and 73, it'll just return a number for you. So don't ask me why I thought of that. Yeah, go ahead. None that I know of. So the question is around, you know, once you have a model defined in Keras, you have two choices. You can continue and train it in Keras, or you can convert it to TensorFlow and train it in TensorFlow. Right? So you have kind of these parallel paths that diverge, and then they can kind of come back together. And on a local machine, is there any advantage to training on Keras versus training on a TensorFlow estimator? Um, off the top of my head, I can't think of any in particular, but maybe Pneeth has some more extended yeah, thoughts. Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, Keras is the, the official TensorFlow uh, model authoring layer. So you want to use Keras to author your architecture. The dispatch and the execution of the model itself uh, should be done through estimated API. Um, what that means is that your authoring language now is m much less verbose. Um, and it has all the same benefits uh, of, of TensorFlow because the underlying <laughs> Uh, uh, execution engine is actually TensorFlow, so that that was actually an official thing from from TensorFlow, and that's uh, that's why you want to use the TF Keras because that's a it subsumes the open source uh, Keras. And kind of the the rationale behind kind of why we recommend converting to Estimator in general um, and training on the Estimator. It's like you know I already have a Keras model, why don't I just train it as it is? Um, is if, if my understanding is correct more based around the fact that, you know, should you want to then move to a more, you know, a larger data set, a more, you know, maybe several GPUs hooked up to the same machine, uh, moving to any, you know, any number of cloud environments, those sorts of things then become a lot easier and become basically seamless um, if you already have a TensorFlow estimator. And there's also certain benefits uh, in terms of the, the code, <laughs> the conversion can be made a little bit easier in certain spots if you convert it and train it as is, rather than trying to convert afterwards. There's actually one more, one more benefit. So uh, uh, I know how many of you have heard of Polarboard. Uh, it actually uses this strategy called All Reduce. So TensorFlow now has in Contrib a distribution strategy. So you basically can tell TensorFlow that whether you want to use a, uh, uh, yeah, a PSS or workers or All Reduce, Ring All Reduce, uh, which is a much better technique to do uh, distribution. Uh, and that you can plug in with uh, the, the estimator very seamlessly. Uh, so that, that's another benefit yeah. of doing that. Yeah, it, it seems like the, the kind of push is really around, you know, can, keeping the Keras APIs kind of clean and um, readable and, and as possible while 
uh, leveraging the benefits of kind of the estimator um, distribution strategies and distribution technology that's under the hood there. Cool. Any other questions before we move to random number generator? <laughs> yeah, please. So this question whether or not it's easier to develop yeah, a prototype. For prototyping, I mean, a lot of it's going to depend on your use case um, and the kind of data that you have. Um, you know, I, I can see the benefits of both, right? Like on one side, you, Keras has an arguably simpler API and perhaps fewer kind of um, concepts that you have to kind of learn. Um, so, so I guess part of it is like the question of do you already know one of these two libraries going into it, right? And so the, there's a different comparison if you say, I know Keras and I know TensorFlow, which one should I use? Versus I don't know either, which one should I learn? Right, which one is better, which one is faster. In those two use cases, they, it, it can kind of lead to different considerations. Um, and then, of course, there's the consideration of your actual data format. I, I think at this point, both libraries are you know, reasonably clean. Um, but uh, as Puneet mentioned, kind of going forward, the officially kind of supported and developed and um, promoted method of working with TensorFlow will be through Keras especially for the model authoring step where you construct the model structure. Um, so TensorFlow 1.9 just came out a few days ago. And it um, comes with a total refresh of the TensorFlow um, tutorial website um, in terms of the guides, the getting started guides. They are now all pivoted to Keras and uh, eager mode, which we didn't talk about here. but. We'll just skip that point. Who cares? Yeah. So, so basically, um, cares and more cares. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Um, the data science workbench. You know, this is kind of you know a very key data set. You have it, but you know, in real life, you get data. You get some more data. You want to retrain models. Mm -hmm. data, yeah, data. absolutely. So in a version control, we talk about this. Okay, so yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the question is around kind of the difficulties behind uh, versioning data sets and uh, collaboration of training models on differing versions of those data, as well as um, collaborating on the source code itself, um, which which perhaps you know. Software engineering has developed more uh, standards around than for data. Um, so I'll, I'll throw a few kind of ideas ar around here. Uh, one is that in addition to the Kaggle kernels being versioned, the data sets are actually also versioned. So you can create new versions of your data set. And when you combine that with the notion that you can have private data sets that are shared among a, sub a selected group of users, then you, you can fit together a decent collaboration model in that sense, right? Because you have version notebooks, you have version data sets, both uh, with ability to do access control. Uh, that being said, the, um, you know, obviously Kaggle kernels are not going to kind of serve all your production needs, right? It's a great kind of learning and collaborative platform, but when, you, when it comes time to uh, deploy your model, when you're not just like, competing in a competition or doing something for fun, um, then you kind of end up having to sometimes look elsewhere. Um, with You mentioned CoLab earlier today. And so in CoLab, what's neat about it, right? and I forgot to mention this in the pro-con list um, by accident, I assure you, because it is a neat feature. 
Colab is like Jupyter Notebooks, Google Doc style. So, and I mean that in its entirety. In particular, it lets you do simultaneous editing, just like in Google Docs. So if I'm in the Colab and you're in the Colab, we are both running against the same computer in the back end. It's, more, it's like you and I are sitting side by side at the same machine, but we, for some reason, have two monitors and the same file pulled up so we can look at different parts at the same time. And it means that we can put comments in, just like in Google Docs. So you can actually add comments to someone else's collab and say, like, hey, you know, I don't think this is quite right. You know, maybe you could try this thing. Or you could use it to ask questions to your collaborators, right? And so there's a lot of different pieces kind of there. Um, I don't know that there's any good kind of all the things combined under the sun in one, you know, one package at this stage. Um, I'm sure folks are working to you know make that happen and, and get the advantages of the different tools and kind of put them in a more unified manner to a reduce confusion but also increase the functionality and improve the workflows around this. So yeah, I mean that kind of goes back to the the central point around this. You know that the tooling is kind of still in development, right? Just across the the field in general, right? There's new things happening all the time and for the most part, those new things are better. Those you know, better things are coming, and they are coming at a rapid rate. And um, you know, it's an exciting time for sure. Any other? You want to add anything to the tooling? No, no. Uh, Point. The tooling. I just wanted to say that uh, you know all these assets, the videos, uh, and you know code uh, which was shared, uh, you know, will be available. So check out our Google AI Huddle uh, channel. Uh, is that the right term on Twitter? <laughs> Uh, hashtag, sorry. Hashtag, yeah, hashtag. Sorry, not, not channel. Um, and you know, that's where you, know, you basically can watch for uh, all our announcements and content and everything. So uh, we'll be doing that. Yeah. And Is yeah. it raffle time? Sorry? Is it raffle time? Uh, I guess so. Uh, unless there are more questions. <laughs> Thank you.